Hello and welcome to Thursday Thoughts, in which I present my November month-end wrap-up and December TBR. The first book I finished for non-fiction November was The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. I rated this book as a B, a book that is worth reading and to be kept on your bookshelves as a reminder and possibly to reread at a later date. The second book I read for non-fiction November was Casanova's Women by Judith Summers. I rated this book a C, an okay book to be read and recycled. Therefore, borrow it from your public library or buy it cheaply from a book sale. I also finished reading The Last Cavalier by Alexander Duma. I've already spoken about the first half in my November mid-month wrap-up, which deals with Bonaparte in his role as the first consul. The second half covers the adventures of the Comte de saint hermine during the period when Napoleon was Emperor of the French from 1804. I rated the first half of this novel as A, one to be read again and to be bought in hardcover. Did the second half live up to the promise of the first half? Yes, it certainly did. But to do this novel justice, I would have to review every single one of its 120 chapters, as nearly every chapter is a gem in and of itself. It is a book of thrilling adventures, involving maritime battles, tiger hunts, danger from leopards, a monstrous boa constrictor, a journey to Burma with two beautiful women, political intrigue, escape from prison and encounters with bandits. There's a marvellous chapter on Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar and so much more that it is impossible to mention everything that Dumas packs into this rich and rewarding novel. I absolutely loved it and I highly recommend it to you if you like adventure, characterization, history, a thrilling story and brilliant writing. Dumas portrays the Comte de saint hermine as a superhero rather than as a hero, as a superhuman rather than as a human. So do not expect any character development because saint hermine is endowed with all the superhero qualities, which means that he excels at everything. He is stronger than anyone else. He is more courageous, more successful, a better swordsman than even a fencing master, a crack shot who can kill a tiger with one shot every time, can fight with sharks and rip them open. He can charge into a skirmish with the English who are so inspired that they provide him with safe conduct back to the French camp. This and much more attaches itself to the Comte de saint hermine so that it is impossible to see him as a normal human being with flaws or weaknesses because Dumas doesn't give him any. So there is a certain amount of suspension of disbelief required to follow his adventures, but they are told with such compelling force and interesting detail that it is worth doing so. And overall, I rate this book as A, to be read again. In the last half of non-fiction November, I read How Far From Austerlitz, Napoleon 1805-1815 to by Alistair Horne. After the first couple of chapters which serve as an introduction, the rest of the text deals with the, t the ten years in which Napoleon was Emperor of the French and the Scourge of Europe. There are precise details of campaigns and battles and political alliances and strategies, some of which were successful and some of which failed. As a military biography, it contains everything anyone would want to know about Napoleon as a military figure and is excellent of its type. It is worth reading once and thus I rate it a B, to be read 
and kept on your bookshelves as a reminder. I've read 93 pages of Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. My initial reactions to this novel are far from favourable and there are three reasons for this. First is the style. Mantel employs short staccato sentences often of one, two or three words. I have only ever seen this style used by US authors who have been through the sausage machine of a creative writing course. I don't know whether Mantel has taken a, such a course or if she has been influenced by reading US authors, but it is a star which I detest. Second is her approach to her story, which is to tell it obliquely, in which she suggests rather than explains, so that it is not always clear who is speaking or what is being spoken about. Also the use of he without any indication which he is speaking is confusing until it begins to dawn that he is Cromwell, except when it isn't. And third, from a great opening in which Cromwell is being kicked about the head by his father, prompting him to run away to sea at the age of 15, I was full of anticipation that Mantell was going to tell us some thrilling adventures and provide some character development. But in the next scene, Mantell projects us forward 25 years to when Cromwell is a 40-year-old lawyer working for the second most powerful man in the kingdom, Cardinal Wolsey, the Lord Chancellor. What happened in the 25 years to bring this about? Mantell is silent and I was left wondering how this could possibly have happened. So Wolsey and Cromwell are chatting away about this and that when suddenly out of the blue and without any preceding action or exposition or any interaction between Wolsey and the King, it is two years later and Wolsey is being turfed out of his house by the King's men. Why is Cardinal Wolsey being ejected from his house? What has happened to bring about the King's displeasure? We don't know, because Mantell doesn't tell us. The review extracts contained in the first five pages of the book have the following. Risky with its narrative. Consistent originality. Intricate construction. Brimming with invention. Delightfully poetic, vivid in image and phrase. Mantell is one of our bravest as well as most brilliant writers. Breezily poetic. Lyrically yet cleanly and tightly written. You will notice from these extracts that Mantell is being praised for her experimental writing, which borders on a poetic form of writing in the modern style, quirky, jagged, staccato, suggested, implied rather than stated, oblique. The most noticeable absence from all these words of praise from the reviewers is that they do not say that her novel was either delightful, entertaining or enjoyable. Instead, they used words like brilliant, indisputably great, an extraordinary trick, bold and sweeping, expert. The fact that it won the Booker Prize ought to have been a trigger warning because with its experimental writing, Wolf Hall is typical Booker Prize fodder. I did not enjoy reading these 93 pages and Although I had a particular purpose in mind when I began reading Wolf Hall, I have decided to DNF Wolf Hall together with its sequel, Bring Up the Bodies, which I had planned to read in December. So I rate the 93 pages I have read of Wolf Hall as E, which equals early exit. However, to be fair, I would have to say that I am not Mantell's target reader, as I prefer a narrative-driven style with clear character development and a straightforward traditional linear plot. I'm planning to read The Passionate Enemies by Jean Plady in preparation for the fourth episode of my series on the Normans and Plantagenets.
and my non-fiction pick for December is the two-volume biography of Samuel Taylor Coleridge by Richard Holmes. The first volume is called Early Visions and in November I have read 106 pages of 364 so far. When I finish this I will read volume 2 which is called Darker Reflections. Now for my two book haul. I bought True Grit by Charles Portis after watching the movie with Jeff Bridges, Matt Damon and Hayley Steinfeld. Joey of Game of Authors ch chose it in his tag I love the book, I love the movie. However, in spite of the fact that the bookseller said that they had dispatched it, the next day I received a notice that my money had been refunded and they quoted account adjustment as the reason. So I can only assume that they did not have the book even though they said that it had been dispatched. So I've had to order it from another bookseller. The second book I bought was Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. David Murphy, among several others, has spoken about this book, so and so I decided to buy it. And it has arrived. And so I'm going to read this in, in place of Wolf Hall and bring up the bodies. So far in November I have read 48 pages and what I've read so far is excellent. Bunsen Dove won the Pulitzer Prize in 1986. Unlike the Booker P Prize, the Pulitzer Prize actually chooses books that are readable. Four previous Pulitzer Prize winners that I have read and thoroughly enjoyed are The Stone Diaries by Carol Shields, The Killer Angels by Michael Shara, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, and The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Contrasted with that list is my list of Booker Prize wi winners that I have DNF'd. They include Lincoln in the Bardo by George Sanders, The Line of Beauty by Alan Hollinghurst, The English Patient by Michael Ondaatje, Possession by A.S. Byatt, Schindler's Ark by Thomas Keneally, and Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. I could only find one novel on the B Booker Prize list that I've actually enjoyed, and that is The Remains of the Day by Katsuo Ishiguro. They actually got that one right. And now here's a quick recap, and I'll be back on Tuesday with The Donut Book Tag. <laughs>